Let's start with a scenario. Imagine a cave where a group of prisoners have been chained since birth. In the prisoner's head are in a fixed place, forcing them to look directly in the wall front of them. Behind them is a raised platform where a fire is blazing. Between the fire and the prisoners is a walkway with a raised wall, so people pass along the walkway, either holding statues and figures of animals and plants above the wall, which subsequently cast shadows into the cave. The shadows are all that the prisoners know, and they start to name each shadow, and they subsequently form the basis of the prisoner's sense of reality. One day, a prisoner is let loose. He turns to look behind him and is blinded by the sheer light of the fire. So once his eyes have adjusted, he takes a closer look at the fire and discovers the walkway with the people carrying statues. He starts talking to one of the statue carriers, who explains that the shadows that the prisoners believe to be real are actually just representations of the statues, which in turn are representative of the things in the real world. The prisoner is then dragged out of the cave into the light of the day. At first, he's blind by the sun because he's never seen it before. So he squints and covers his eyes, but gradually he becomes used to the light and starts looking around him, seeing all the plants, animals and people. Finally, his eyes have adjusted so well that he can look directly at the sun, regarding it as the true light. Possessed with this new knowledge, he feels he must go back into the cave and tell his fellow prisoners what he has come to know. He journeys back into the cave, stumbling and tripping over the darkness, because his eyes are now used to the light, and has trouble seeing and navigating the cave. He reaches the prisoners and sets about explaining everything he's seen, telling them that they have lived a lie their entire lives, and that the shadows are not their reality. The prisoners don't believe a word. In fact, they scorn and belittle him for his new beliefs. To test his intellect, they play a little game of seeing who can name as many shadows as possible. The released prisoner doesn't do very well, obviously, his eyes aren't adjusted to the darkness of the cave, and he has trouble seeing the shadows. The prisoners declare the released man to be stupid, insane, and dangerous, and from this, they threaten to kill him for expressing his new beliefs and ideologies. Now, what you just imagined was a thought experiment that is also known as the allegory of the cave, or Plato's cave. To make sense of what you just imagined, the cave is a metaphor of society in general. Plato believed that the society and a whole is ignorant, like the prisoners in the cave, and they're happy with their reality of the truth. The released prisoner is a metaphor for a person who searches for enlightenment beyond what society has to offer. When the released man travels back, so from dark to light, or from light to dark, he may become confused, which is perfectly fine. Assuming you're still watching the video, what this whole experiment really shows is that you should never be dismissive of someone's ideas or their ideologies. While it could sound like nonsense, listen to the reasoning behind it, rather than just following the crowd. Some of the greater discoveries and inventions were made because they refused to follow the norm. A great example would be Galileo with his groundbreaking theory on how the Earth isn't in the middle of the galaxy, the Sun is. Of course, this idea was rejected as this went against the Catholic teachings. However, we know that Galileo was indeed right. But you make videos on games! Why am I making videos on the current state of society and enlightenment? And no, it's not to recruit you for a secret agenda. Well, the last time I made one, which was the Diotama's Ladder, it was way too long-winded and frankly, it wasn't very good. The examples were terrible, now I feel like this thought experiment really helps me with my main point for today's video, Meta versus Innovation. Starting with the basics, what even is Meta? Turns out it's actually an abbreviation for Most Effective Tactic Available. So the next time you hear the word Meta from someone, they're basically saying this is the best solution. Now I can imagine a lot of people are not going to be happy about this. If you want an example, sometime back on my Discord server, we were discussing tier lists, and someone said, in OB55, Shaolin is meta because of Planted Legendary. Now, if we had to listen to this, it means that picking Shaolin with this Planted Legendary would mean that you would basically win all of the games because it's the most effective strategy. But that's not the case, is it? We have no way of knowing what the exact winners for champions are. So we need to get creative. By using sites like My Paladins and Paladins Guru, we can see that the Shaolin has a win rate between 45 and 49. But if he is meta, shouldn't this be higher? Anyways, we're getting off track. There are multiple reasons why Shaolin's win rate could be low. He is kind of hard to play, he has projectile aim, new players could be playing him wrong, etc, etc. This leads me to my next point. Who dictates this meta? For this, we have a few candidates. The biggest ones are community, developers, the professional scene, and the content creators. Now, not spending too much time on all of them, let's begin. The community? That's a no. Generally speaking, the community haven't shown the best judgement in the previous iterations of the game or any big patches. So to think that the community comes up with the best tactic every single time is stretch. The developers? Again, no. 
The more the devs interfere with the game, the less organic the game tends to be. So it's in their best interest to look at the data, and if it correlates with the community's opinions, then adjust accordingly. The professional scene. Again, it can't be. Normally the game is patched on Wednesday, with big tournaments happening on Thursday or now Friday, which would be ESL. But with the launch of PGS, this is how it changed a bit. But again, there is a gap. The content creators. I mean, it goes without saying, but adding meta to your title will get you them really easy views. No, but if you're getting a bit serious, content creators are not a great source. And anyway, you need to be a really well known for having a chance to even do so. But if we look at the last in particular, we have something new in the mix. Innovation. Or as most people know it in the game, it's off Metapix. Innovation basically boils down to creating something new. For the game specifically, this would mean new team compositions, positioning, synergies between abilities, and whatever you can think of. Did you know Wormhole Eevee was actually rarely used before Lazy showed off what she can do with her in Timber Mill? Now Wormhole Eevee is a standard way of playing her, assuming you have mechanical skills. Another example would be using environmental hazards to throw people into their demise, which was actually done by Phil very effectively with his Makoa. However, with innovation, we appear to be at an impasse. We don't know who creates or dictates the meta. We know for sure it's from the community, the devs, or the content creators. We then look at the professional scene, but that's where innovation takes place. If it's significant enough or impressive enough, the community seem to adopt it and make it a regular pick in their normal games, which would be casuals. So with this revelation, let me propose something crazy. A lot of people will not like what I'm saying, but bear with me on this, okay? There is no such thing as a meta in this game. Some characters are better, some patch and some are bad. But there's no such thing as the best team comp or bad champions. This is true in both the casual and the pro scene. The casual scene more so than the pro. In pub games with minimal communication, it ends up being a free-for-all most of the time. You can try and build team composition on what works and what doesn't, but at the end of the day, there are still four other people, they have to be on the same page as you, which they're really not. So here picking a champion of the individual character is good, then playing someone for the sake of team composition. So a meta composition here makes no bloody sense. Everybody needs to be on the A game with near perfect execution. Now you and me both know this isn't how the world works. One person will always do whatever the hell they want to do in pubs, and hell, even competitive. So finally, we move on to the pro scene, where there is no restriction on the communication side. I mean, there isn't a barrier in the casual scene as well, but in the pro side, we can say that the communication is a lot more engaging and important. So with this communication, they don't go for standard picks. They try to make something that's not standard because the opponents know what standard is. Now, this again boils on the question, why should you make it any easier for your opponents than it has to be? Now, for those involved slightly in the esports scene, you'll tell me that certain team composition is meta. This could be double tank, double support, or hell, even double flank. However, we still see some really peculiar picks that win. District 69 at one point had picked four tanks with Ceres healing on Jagger 4s, and still managed to win. So coming back to meta, if it really is the best thing available, then the four tanks should always win. But then again, if that loses, then that isn't meta, is it? So when you see the four tanks and one heal loose to let's say four flanks and one damage, then four tanks and one healer is a meta, it would be four flanks and one damage, but they could be counted as well. So what I'm essentially getting at is that meta is essentially a marketing tool or a word that's really in practice the way to do nothing at all. It may get you views on your videos and make you sound like what you're talking about, but in fact, if you use the word meta wrong, that just means you don't know what you're talking about. If meta just means standard picks, then you should be clear about that. However, we know that meta does not mean standard. Nowadays, the base games have more champions in total than you can have in your team, so chances are there are more than one way of tackling a certain problem. If one team composition is indeed meta, there is equally able composition that can counter the so-called meta composition. Adding further in competitive games have a mixture of picking and banning phases, so there really cannot be a meta at all. So the next time you hear someone say, this is meta, or we're going to lose because they have X, kindly ignore any more useful advice they have to offer. Chances are they're a victor player who picked deft hands in a competitive match, proceed to get demolished and blame the team for being noobs. But hey, that's just my experience. You know you could have totally someone who's perfectly legit. And remember, gaming smarter is winning faster. I'll see you all in the next one.